Hello, I'd like to welcome you all to today's webinar on spotted wing Drosophila, which is being presented by a multi-state research team who is working together to find out the most promising organic strategies to manage this invasive and destructive pest on organic farms. I'm your host, Alice Formiga of eOrganic. For the past 10 years, eOrganic has published articles, videos, and webinars about organic farming and research, including an article and several past webinars on spotted wing Drosophila, and you can find all of them on our new website at eOrganic.org and on the eOrganic YouTube channel. So today, I'm very pleased to welcome back the members of the spotted wing Drosophila research team. We have a lot of material to cover, so I'm going to turn this presentation over to the project leader, Ash Sial of the University of Georgia, who will introduce the webinar and the presenters. So um, Ash, I'm going to give you the remote control. Welcome to the Organic Management of Spotted Wing Drosophila webinar. This webinar is being presented by a multi-regional uh, project, uh, Organic Ma SWD Management uh, a project team. This uh, project is funded by USDA NIFA through OREI uh, uh, a grant, uh, uh, OREI funded grant. And my name is Ash Sayal. I am a project director uh, of this project and I will start off by introducing this uh, uh, project and giving you an overview of the project and then I'll hand this over to the other team members to give you more specifics of uh, of the progress that has been made on each objective of this project. Spotted wing Drosophila is a vinegar fly of Asian origin. It uh, has been known as a pest of uh, fruit crops since early 1900s. It was first detected in the mainland US in 2008 and since then has spread throughout the United States and has emerged as one of the most devastating pests of small and stone fruits in the modern history. Adults female of this fly have very unique ovipositor as you can see uh, on, on the screen here. Their, their ovipositor is uh, sclerotized and has serrations that these females use to deposit eggs in otherwise healthy ripe fruit. The susceptibility window in most of the crops starts as soon as the fruits start to change color and once the egg is laid, the whole process of the development from egg to adulthood completes in relatively short period of time, about eight to 10 days at 25 degrees centigrade, which means that this fly can go through several generations in, in, during a field season and build up populations very quickly. This amounts to huge crop losses in many cropping systems, including uh, all small fruits, blueberries, blackberries, raspberries, strawberries, cherries, and other, other uh, fruit crops as well. In 2014, a survey was conducted to estimate crop losses, which were uh, about $900 million per year. When we looked at this uh, pest, especially organic management was a major challenge because strategies to control organically were very limited. At that time, a, large team of researchers from across the United States uh, came together to propose uh, this project, which was funded by OREI. This team comprises of uh, uh, re researchers from 11 major land grant universities and USDA scientists. Just to give you a visual of the distribution of this uh, project team and overall organic uh, acreage of small fruits. This is based on USDA uh, data in uh, 2016. So basically we have a, a nationwide team that is currently working on, on this uh, pest. The major goal of this project is to develop and implement systems-based organic SWD management programs that are compatible with USDA national organic program and are true to the ethos of organic agriculture. These programs will be based on foundation of cultural, physical, behavioral, and biological control tactics bolstered by NOP compliant insecticides when needed. The specific objectives of this uh, project include evaluation of behavioral tactics for organic management of SWD, 
improve effectiveness of, and feasibility of cultural strategies for organic management of SWD. Incorporating biological control in organic uh, SWD management programs, integrating new uh, OMRI approved chemicals into the season long uh, IPM programs for SWD as they become available. And finally, develop an integrated outreach approach to disseminate that information to the stakeholders. Now I will uh, hand this over to the other team members who will, uh, Elena Rhodes, she will uh, uh, give us an update on behavioral management tactics. Kelly Hamby, she will give us, uh, she's from University of Maryland, she will give us an update on cultural uh, tactics. Kent Dana from UC Berkeley will give us an update on biological control. And Craig Robus uh, from University of Georgia, he will give us an update on chemical control strategies that uh, have been developed so far to control SWD. And in the end, I'll come back to summarize everything and take questions that you may have. Now I'll hand this over to Elena Rhodes to give us update on behavioral control strategies to manage SWD. Okay, so Elena, I'm gonna give you the remote control. So just click on that screen once to activate it. Oh, went out of full screen again. You can just put it back in full screen there. Okay. Hello, my name is Elena Rhodes. I am Dr. Oscar Leibert's lab manager and feet on the ground for this project. And I'm gonna be talking about behavioral tactics for SWD management. Dr. Leibert and Dr. Rodriguez Sayona are mainly focused on SPLAT, whereas uh, Dr. Von Walton has been looking at this food-based gum, so I'm gonna talk about both. And I'm gonna start with the SPLAT, which they're now marketing as a product called Hook SWD. And the basis of it is this gel matrix that in the case of the spotted wing Drosophila stuff was col colored this bright reddish pink color because we discovered that's attracted to them. And this is what it looks like when it's applied in the field fresh, and then you can see after seven days on the left side of the screen and after 14 days on the right side compared to the fresh. There's not a lot left after 14 days, but this of course is in the, is in the very hot human environment of Florida in some of the places where it doesn't get quite as hot as down here. I'm sure it would last even longer. So we've done some field trials. First, I'm gonna talk about a trial in Florida blackberries that was done on an organic blackberry farm in Marion County, Florida. We had treatments with no SWAT applied, SWAT applied every seven days and SWAT applied every 14 days. And this was with either no insecticide program in the background, just Grandivo applications in the background or the grower standard in the background, which in this case was a rotation of Entrust and Grandivo. And we did weekly adult monitoring and fruit sampling and you can see in the picture that was how we applied the splat with the backpack sprayers which is not the easiest thing to apply because it's very thick and viscous because of the gel matrix and within that matrix in this particular case there's a food attractant and spinosad as the insecticide so attract and kill one of the things we're looking at in the future is maybe mixing it with other organic insecticides. So this was the plot map for this particular trial. And where it's blue, that was where the standard treatment was applied. The orange is the Grandivo and the green was untreated control. And within that, with the different patterns is the splat. So the empty blocks were no splat. The Dots were splat applied every seven day and the diagonal slashes were splat applied every 14 days. So the two different factors on top of each other. With the trap data, we did get some reductions where the splat was used, especially when Grandivo by itself was sprayed in the background and also some with the standard as well. And we saw similar results with the emergence data, though 
the emergence in the no splat with the Entrust Grand Evo rotation wasn't different than using splat, but we know that Entrust is very effective against SWD, so that wasn't surprising. But it did help if Grand Evo was just being used. We were, they also did some trials in blueberries in New Jersey, and they actually diluted the splat to an 80% strength so that the pump worked better. They sprayed it off the back of an ATV also so they could do uh, much larger plots than we did. Our BlackBerry trial is a smaller plot study. And they looked primarily at incubation data after collecting fruit samples. And there were two different farms. This is what the first farm looked like, where they had five acre blocks, so two and a half acres for a control and two and a half acres for a treatment and for each of those on both farms, so nice size plots for this. And this was the second farm. Hook is now the registered trade name for Splat, so it goes back and forth in the presentation. And what they found was that the effect of the Splat breaks down with increasing spotted wing densities. So on the left, you can see farm one, which had much higher densities than Farm two, if you look at the y-axis, which was the number of SWD emerged per 100 grams of fruit, about a six-fold higher. On the farm with that higher number, there's numerically a reduction with the splat or the hook, but no, no statistical difference, whereas significant reductions where the spotted wing per 100 flute were much lower. So that was very interesting, and we wanted to tease out some of these details with some cage studies. We had these big field cages where we could do very specific things under more controlled conditions. So in the first one, we were looking at that fly density question. You can see a picture of the cage, the blueberry plant in it, and what the shells, so to speak, the frames of those cages look like up on the top. And that's a real good picture of what the slat looks like after it's um, dried for 24 hours. We applied it to essentially scotch tape or clear sticky tape so that we could easily take it off the bushes because cleaning it off of a a leaves or stems directly is a pain in the butt. In this case, there were five fruit clusters or 25 fruit in each cage with five spotted wing densities, 0, 20, 40, 60, and 80 flies per cage. And there were three different treatments with the splat the no splat control, and then splat applied to the leaves and splat applied to the bark. We wanted to see if it made a difference where it was applied. And so eggs per fruit, adults emerged, and adults um, alive were all measured. The results were all very similar, so I'm just going to show the eggs per fruit data. And as you can see, no matter the density of SWG, there was a significant reduction in number of eggs laid, but that started to break down at the higher SWD density, and you can really see that if we graph that a bit differently. We have density of the Suzuki eye down on the x axis, and on the y axis is the percent mortality. And you can see how the, the lines dip when you get to that 80 flies per cage. So, a breakdown when you start to get really high fly densities, just like we saw in the field. We also did a similar study looking at different densities of fruit. So in this case, we held the fly density constant at 40 per cage, and then we had either 0, 5, 10, or 20 fruit clusters in each cage, that being 0, 25, 50, or 100 fruit. And I looked at emergence and adult survival. And again, I'm going to focus on the emergence data. And these are just some of the pictures of what those look like. You can see the clear, sticky tape with the splat tied to the stem for that application, and then the one on the leaf next to it, and you can see the berry clusters. And that third picture, that's 10 berry clusters. You can see how dense that was getting. You can imagine how dense it was when I had 20 berry clusters hung on a single plant. And the red trap was what we used to look at adults. Not very effective by itself, but it does work in cages. I'd be curious to look at it using with uh, lures attached to it, but that's a whole other project. And what we found with fruit clusters is, again, with higher densities of fruit, the control with the splat breaks down. This is not surprising because the attractant in the splat gel matrix is a food-based product. 
so when we had just the five fruit clusters, the 25 fruit significant reduction compared with the control, which is blue, and no differences between where the splat was applied, or is that really broke down at 10 and especially at 20? So now I'm going to switch and talk about the food grade gum that Dr. Walton has been developing. And this slide just shows how that was developed in the first place. You can see on the top two pictures are some spotted wing that were marked with fluorescent dyes that they ate and what they looked like in the light. And then when you turn the lights off, and that was used to see their overposition behavior on fruit. And that scraping behavior on the fruit on the right that you can see only occurred on fruit where other spotted wing females had laid eggs, which was really interesting. And so they looked at the volatiles, the smells coming off of those fruits. And what they found, you can see in the middle, is a volatile profile from an infested fruit, essentially a machine readout showing what um, chemicals are coming off of the fruit. And they identified which of these were attractive, and that was what the attractant in this food-based gum is. And in this case, this is not an attractant kill. This is an arrestant. So the SWD come and lay their eggs in the gum instead of laying them in the fruit, and it reduces fruit infestation that way. So they did some efficacy trials, and those first four fruit were done by applying the gum to a mesh bag and comparing that to fruit in mesh bags without the gum. And there was re reduction in eggs laid in the fruit in all four of the crops tested that way, blueberry, raspberry, cherry, and grape. And then they did studies in strawberries in cages where the gum was in contact with the drip irrigation in this case and got significant reduction in the strawberries as well. You can see in that last graph. So very promising results. It lasts for about uh, 21 days, as you can see from the figure there. That last um, one is 28 days. I'm not sure what happened to the numbers. Welcome to the fun of technology. But the, uh, the set you, yeah, so it lasts for about 21 days. And if you apply it in a cage and compare that to control cages, there is a reduction in the severity of infestation. So the redder the color is, the higher the infestation. And so you can see on the left is the control cage. The infestation is heavy. And it's even heavier now with, um, and it's heaviest, interestingly, at the bottom of the plants. And you can see it's still heavier at the bottom of the plants where the arrestant, the gum, was used, but the density is much less. As far as the effective range of the gum, not surprisingly, the farther away from the point sources of the gum you get, the higher number of eggs per fruit there are. So that, that information can be used to figure out uh, spacing of, of the gum. And they did do a study looking at the gum in comparison with two different standard pesticide strategies and, of course, an untreated control using plants in cages where they then released specific numbers of SWD. And they got very good results with that as well, significantly lower numbers of eggs per fruit in the arrestant treatment, the gum, compared with the untreated control. And the arrestant treatment was also not different from either of the two pesticide strategies. They also did some studies where they used larger cages over bushes. And you can see how those were set up in the diagram. And in Georgia, they were keeping the gum wet with a water bottle, whereas in Oregon, it was on this mesh in contact with drip irrigation. You can see that picture, um, the bottom picture under the Oregon. That pinkish blob is the gum in contact with the uh, drip tape there. And what was interesting about this is in Georgia, where they tried to keep it moist with the water bottle, it didn't work because it dried out too much. And so you can see the two, the red and the blue lines are two different insecticide treatments. The orange line is the gum treatment, and then the black line is the control. In 
in contrast, in Oregon, where the gum was in contact with the drip irrigation, it was comparable to the two insecticide treatments. So keeping it properly moist is very important. So in summary, with the splat, the splat, or the which they're now marketing as a product called Hook SWD, reduces uh, spotted wing drosophila fruit infestation in the field, but control breaks down at higher spotted wing drosophila and fruit densities. So it's looking like it might be a useful tool as an early season, maybe delay the start of insecticide applications as opposed to something that can be used on its own. The food grade gum, which acts as an arrestant, effectively reduces spotted wing drosophila fruit infestation. It lasts for about 21 days and there is reduced control farther away from point sources. So spacing is important and keeping it moist is very important. It doesn't work very well if it dries out. So that's what I have as far as the behavioral tactics and now we can send it on to the next person. Okay, I'm gonna pass over the screen control to Kelly. And meanwhile, um, I just was wondering whether that gum is commercially available yet. No, it's, it's not yet available. Okay. They're still in the process of uh, uh, doing patent and once that is uh, approved. Okay. Yeah, um, Kelly, you have the control of the slides now, so you should be able to put it in full screen at the bottom there. You can. Um... All right, so I'm going to talk about objective two, which is a cultural controls objective. And really, our goal here is to manipulate the environment so that we're reducing the pest population. What we're really trying to take advantage of is we're trying to make spotted wing drosophila uncomfortable, less able to access resources, um, and also maybe potentially physically exclude spotted wing drosophila. So we're reducing habitat favorability for spotted wing populations. So what we know about spotted wing drosophila from the lab is that they don't survive when the temperature is constantly above 87.6 degrees Fahrenheit. And adults are not going to be laying eggs if temperatures are at 95 degrees Fahrenheit or above. We also know that their lifespan and egg production increase with relative humidity, and they do better at greater than 70% relative humidity. So they tend to like cooler and more humid conditions relative um, to some of the hotter and drier conditions. So a lot of our goals with these, with these cultural controls is to try to make it hotter and drier. So today, uh, and one of the things to think about within the canopy of your crops and small fruits, is we have these different um, levels of heat depending on where you're looking at relative to the sun. So here you can see this is a blueberry bush with solar radiation. Typically, the side that's closer to the sun is going to be warmer than the side that's farther away from the sun. We see the coolest and moistest conditions right here in the middle. And this tracks with some of the data that we've seen in terms of looking at adult activity and also the level of infestation within plants is that we tend to see the highest infestation in the center parts of the canopy. And then in cane berries where we have a little bit more um, canopy density at the bottom, we also tend to see more infestation in the lower part of the canopy. So the interior and lower parts of the canopy, the places where it's, it's cooler and it's more humid, tend to have higher infestation and higher activity. So our goal with our habitat manipulation strategies, our cultural control strategies, is to make that less favorable. Um, so I'm going to go through six different things that we've, we've looked into. The first is exclusion netting. I'm going to talk a little bit about different irrigation strategies, and these are particularly relevant in dry climates. We're also going to look at weed mats, levels of pruning, harvest frequency, and finally refrigeration. So starting off with physical exclusion, this works really well if it's done right. You need a mesh netting that's less than one millimeter in size to keep spotted wing drosophila out. And you can get 100% control or total exclusion if the conditions are perfect. And what do I mean by the conditions are perfect? The key thing is that these have to be installed before spotted wing is already in the field. And you have to keep the flies out of the tunnels. So if you're opening them up to do harvest or you have to go in and do do other um, management things. Also, if you have weather that's caused damage to the netting, anytime, this, as soon as the flies can get into the tunnel, the tunnel is not actually within the tunnel, it's actually a really nice habitat for spotted wing. So we see that the spotted wing just build up within the tunnel if they get in. And there has been some work to look at whether you could use baited traps in addition to using the exclusion netting as a way uh, to keep spotted wing out, but that doesn't reduce infestation. 
And if you're installing the, these tunnels before spotting, sometimes that means that you're also installing them before bloom, especially in blueberries. So you may have to consider including some pollinators if you're doing this physical, physical exclusion strategy so that you're getting good pollination. But some of the advantages of using physical exclusion is that tunnel grown fruit is often higher quality um, and 100% control is possible without having to use insecticides. And this is especially true in blueberries where we see that, that system just tends to work a little bit better because you have a, a little bit of a tighter harvest window and less blowouts in, the, um, in terms of the netting getting disrupted. Um, so one of the reasons that we see that the tunnel, the tunnel grown fruit is higher quality is because you are protecting it from weather and birds in addition to protect, protecting it from spotted wing drosophila. So we do see some nice quality fruit when you're using physical exclusion. So moving on to uh, irrigation, this work has been done in Oregon where it's a little bit hotter and drier and looking at this comparison between using overhead irrigation in blueberries relative to using dip, drip irrigation. And for this study, what they did is they used our um, pupae. They put pupal cards out um, as well as infested fruit out and they put them above the mulch here and also below the mulch, looking at how irrigation impacted spotted wing survival, survivorship in infested fruit and then also in loose pupae. And what they found is that the control is where they kept these pupae in the lab. We're looking on the y-axis as the number of spotted wing that emerged from the pupae. And then we have the drip versus the sprinkler. So when we're looking at above the weed mat, you see a little bit lower emergence in general, except for where we're having these lab controls. And the sprinkler helps the spotted wing survive a little bit better. Where we really see the difference is below the weed mat, where when we have that sprinkler irrigation, the spotted wing are really doing much better below the weed mat than if you're using drip irrigation. So looking at mulches, we're looking at a very similar type of study. We compared a weed mat fabric to a wood chip mulch and then some, some states where this is more common also had a bare ground treatment. We did this across, across multiple sites in this project. And again, we were using these um, sentinel spotted wing to really see what the impact of the mulch was on spotted wing survivorship. Again, looking at infested fruit above the mulch and below the mulch and pupae above the mulch and below the mulch. And what we found in, was that there was less survival above the mulch, regardless of what type of mulch it was. Um, and in some states, especially places where we had smaller bushes and a lot of sunlight on that black fabric, the weed mat had lower survival and infestation in terms of th these artificially infested fruit. The other advantage of the mulch is that it also acts as a barrier for the larvae to get below the mulch. So here you can see this is a picture that was taken in Oregon, by Oregon State you can see these pupae where the spotted wing came out of the fruit, went to pupae in the ground, and they couldn't get to the ground where the conditions are more favorable because this mulch was stopping them. The other advantage of the, the nice weed mat fabric is it does have a lot of advantages in terms of weed control in organic systems as well. So moving on to pruning, typically when we think about pruning in uh, small fruit crops, we're aiming to optimize our yield and also optimize the ease of harvest. So we looked at pruning in both caneberries and blueberries. And this, we had three different densities where we had no pruning, which would have a high density canopy, medium pruning, which was something intermediate, and then high pruning where you would have a really low density canopy. Um, and this just gives you kind of a sense of what that looked like. At every different site, we had different grower standards and different varieties that were being used. But we looked at the trends across all of these different states to see how pruning could impact spotted and drosophila. And what we found was that in caneberries, having these different canopy densities did change the canopy climate, but only changed it very slightly. So uh, the differences were between 0.2 of a degree Fahrenheit and 1.3 of a degree Fahrenheit, and between half a percent relative humidity and 1.3% relative humidity. So we had these small changes in the canopy climate, which translated to very small changes in the amount of infestation. So we had 0.14 fewer larvae per gram of fruit in the low density canopies relative to the other two densities. Um, and in blueberries, we didn't actually see as much spotted wing infestation, so we weren't able to see any significant differences in the pruning. But what we did do is we put in, again, these sentinel artificially infested fruit. We put them at different heights in the canopy and in the different canopy densities, 
We did this in both Georgia and Oregon. And when we looked at the number of spotted wing that were able to successfully emerge, this is across three years in Oregon, and this is how well they do if you hold them in the laboratory in good conditions. You can see that at the base of the plant, they weren't doing very well at all, regardless of what year it was. But they were surviving much better in the middle of the plant in that part where we, we were talking about have, having potentially lower temperatures and higher humidity. So and in some years, the week that we put those larvae out, they actually did, they died no matter what. This was a particularly hot week. So when it's really hot, they're not surviving very well. We didn't see any impact from the pruning on fruit quality, so we measured total soluble solids and we also measured um, fruit penetration force and we didn't see any differences in fruit quality and we didn't see any differences in marketable yield. There was a slight impact on total yield, but we didn't see any differences in marketable yield. So pruning could be a strategy um, to keep having high marketable yield in a slight difference in spotted wing drosophila. The other advantage of this is it may also improve spray coverage and also harvest efficiency. Um, so there are some additional benefits from these horticultural control strategies for, for fruit production. Moving on to harvest frequency and sanitation, our real goal here is to remove resources for spotted wing drosophila from the farm. So in Michigan, they looked at different harvest frequencies, looking at every day in the light gray, every two days in the medium, and then every three days in black. And this is the num average number of Drosophila eggs and larvae per kilogram, looking at eggs, small larvae, and third instar larvae going along the x-axis. And you can see that, they, that the uh, harvesting every three days had the highest infestation compared to harvesting every two days and every day. And this was in raspberries. And they saw the highest marketable yield per unit effort if they did a two-day harvest interval. So harvesting frequently helps remove those resources from the farm and helps keep the spotted wing pressure down. In addition, thinking about sanitation, it's important to remove and destroy cull fruit. Those again are other resources for spotted wing drosophila to survive in. And if you do remove and destroy your cull fruit, you wanna leave them in a sealed container for at least two to three days in the direct sun to successfully kill the larvae or bury them greater than or equal to two feet deep. Finally, looking at post-harvest cold storage, if you cool the, you want to cool your fruit as soon as possible after harvest, this is going to slow down the development of spotted wing drosophila. Doesn't make your situation any better, but also doesn't make, it keeps it exactly as bad as it was when it came out of the field. So it's important to encourage your consumers to refrigerate. There's been some work looking at post-harvest cold storage in terms of temperature and duration. There's some variation in how long it takes to stop spotted wing drosophila from developing, and that's dependent upon temperature, the temperature you're holding them at, the life stage of the spotted wing that are in the fruit, and the fruit type. So this is an example of holding raspberries at 32 degrees Fahrenheit and raspberries at 35 degrees Fahrenheit, looking at small larvae first instars that are about three days old, or old eggs, so about one day old. And this is the number of spotted wing pupae that successfully emerged. If you've held them at these temperatures, five, four, three, and at, the control was held at room temperature. So you can see that the longer you hold them and the colder you hold them, um, the less spotted wing are surviving. And then if you look at the different fruits, there's differences between blueberries, strawberries, blackberries, and raspberries and how long you have to hold them um, to really get them to stop being able to successfully emerge. And it's particularly challenging in blackberries and raspberries. So we've run through some of the things that we've looked at um, in terms of cultural controls for spotted wing drosophila and how we can add them to the overall system to help keep spotted wing drosophila levels low. Um, moving on to, to Ken to talk about biological controls. Okay, Kent, I'm going to hand you over the screen control in just a second here. Thank you. Morning, West Coast. Good afternoon, East Coast. Okay, you should have control. Oh, you got to get it done to full screen again at the bottom there. If you don't see the icon, let me know. Yeah, I don't see the icon. Okay, on. that's weird. Yeah. Here we go. Okay, I just got it in for you. So hopefully Great. you should be able to just click. And if not, um, just tell me next and I'll click. For next, you. please. Yeah. Well, I'm going to talk about biological controls. And I'm going to start by mentioning there's a nice review article by Jana Lee that looked at the different 
types of controls we can implement right now. And we have to remember that most of the biological controls are closely tied to the spotting drosophila itself. Next. Next, please, Alice. So while we think about the insect attacking the crops, such as blueberries, the natural enemies are all oftentimes attacking a different stage or a different area. So for example, you've got the larvae that drop to the ground and pupate in the soil. It's very common for natural enemies, especially things like ants and earwigs, to attack spot and wing in that area. Next, please. Uh, it's more difficult to look at what is going to attack the adult, um, especially disrupting mating populations. Next, please. So what the group has done in this review is gone through the different types of biological controls, such as applying a pathogen. Next, please. Uh, we can also have traps where adults will go in, pick up a fungi, and then move out and spread that through the population. Next, please. Of course, as mentioned, a lot of the predators we've got right now that are on the ground are attacking the pupa. And currently, that's probably one of the biggest biocontrol in terms of natural agents we've got working at this point in time. Next. And what I'm gonna spend most of the time today talking about is the parasitoid population that attacks spotted winter sophila. We've got two kinds of parasitoids, those that attack the larva and those that attack the pupa. Next. And in uh, Jaina's article, there's an appendix. And what you can do is you can look up the literature that we found and you can see the impact it had according to the research that was done on it. Uh, this is just showing, for example, nematodes. Next, please. So what about the parasitoids that attack spotted wing in North America, uh, Canada, US, and Mexico? Well, in all of those areas, we've got these two pupil parasitoids. There are no common names. Uh, one is a pteromallid, one is a, a diapreid. First is pachycropoideus. That's fairly common throughout the United States. The second is trichopria. That's not quite as common. We find it in coastal areas such as coastal California. And it's also common in Europe. Next. We've got a number of larval parasitoids too that attack drosophilid species. So these attack the common vinegar fly, Drosophila melanogaster, but they don't attack our spotted wing drosophila. Um, in Europe, some of these species are found attacking spotted wing, but it's very rare in the United States. So we know we've got pupil parasitoids and we know we need to improve larval parasitism to kind of increase overall natural control of spotted wing. Next. So we'll focus first on these two pupil parasitoids. Uh, this is a photo of Trichopria drosophila attacking spotted wing drosophila pupa. And you can see the blueberry behind it. And again, it's not as widely distributed fairly easy to rear, and people have done tests on this, both in the United States, Europe, and Mexico. Next. Pachycropoideus is much more commonly distributed within the United States than Trichopria. Both of these parasitoids on their own, meaning without manipulation, really don't have high levels of parasitism. I would say on average, it's less than 5% parasitism out in the field normally. Next. So what we wanna think about is can we take these pupil parasitoids and manipulate them to increase percent parasitism? Uh, this can be done through augmentation, either inoculation, which is seeding a natural enemy into the habitat. So you're not releasing a lot, but you're putting the natural enemy into the habitat at an important period. For example, inoculating the riparian zone in spring to have the population build up. That's in comparison to inundation, which is releasing a lot of natural enemies, more like a bioinsecticide, and that would be more common to do in a glass house or a, hoop, or a hoop house setting. And the photo we see there is an example 
that they use this parasitoid that you can purchase from insectaries to control stable flies uh, in barns, dairies, things like that. Next. And people have done this with trichopria for spotted wing drosophila. We just see some examples here from Europe. And the little smiley faces kind of summarize how well this has worked. Um, you can see that in, in northern Italy, they got fairly good reduction, 30% reduction of spotted wing drosophila uh, after doing a release of about 3,000 parasitoids per hectare. In other areas like Spain, it didn't work quite as well. So we've been testing this in the United States as well. And what we'll do now is we'll see a summary slide of the results so far to date. Next. First thing to mention is that our production of the parasitoids are still a little bit crude. So we're not getting to the kinds of numbers I think are needed to really inundate. It's still an inoculation release at this point in time. In my laboratory, we reared about 1 million of the pachycropoides and trichopria in 2019 and released most of these in California, but also sent some to other researchers. Next slide. So what's some of the summary work we've seen so far? Well, in California Caneberry hoop houses, uh, Brian Hope released quite a number of trichopria and pachycropoides and didn't see any difference in parasitism. Um, in fact, it trended to be a little bit higher than the control, but not significantly different. Uh, in Oregon, uh, Jaina found higher parasitism in the release versus the control sites, uh, both doing this in hoop houses and working in riparian zones with augmentorium boxes. Um, we did not see, though, in that test, any difference in fruit infestation. And finally, uh, Mary in uh, Minnesota, releasing again in hoop houses, did not see any difference in spotted wind drosophila infestation. So this is an area that we're going to continue to research. It obviously needs better production of the natural enemies. And we probably need to find out better ways to deliver the material to the hoop houses, to the riparian zone. Next. What I'm going to spend the last few minutes talking about is classic biological control. And this has been a international um, project started with my group with Oregon State and USDA in the United States. We join with Italian researchers and researchers in Switzerland working in CABI. And you can see that with the uh, different red stars. We've been collecting most of our parasitoids in South Korea and Southern China, although we've also collected in Northern China as well. Next. Uh, again, an international effort. Uh, we were joined in all of these studies with participants in China and South Korea that sampled for us before we got there, so we knew where to travel to. We knew uh, which host plants the spotted wind drosophila were on. So for, for example, in the upper left picture, we see Xing King Wang there uh, collecting, and down below, those are little wild mountain strawberries. So we were getting these parasitoids at ground level, and we were getting them in large bushes that were going way up above where we could reach. So that bodes well for these parasitoids working in different types of environment. Uh, we see in the lower left, most of the work to get the material out of quarantine, out of quarantine is done at UC Berkeley, testing these materials against non-target. Without going into any of those results, we'll just cut to the chase of when this material might be getting out to your fields. So next slide, please. So these were the three major larval parasitoids that we found both in China and South Korea, a Ganaspis, a Leptopolina, and an Asobara. The three parasitoids were fairly common. What's important to note is that the Ganaspis and the Leptopolina, the two top pictures, were common early in the season. And these were specialists attacking spotted wind drosophila more than any other 
uh, fruit fly out there. Uh, Asobara, the picture in the lower left, this is more of a generalist parasitoid. So it attacked spotted wing Drosophila. It also attacked Melanogaster and a number of other fly species, which kind of excludes it from ever getting permission to release it in the United States. It also came in later in the season. So what we wanted was something that would attack the spotted wing early in the season and really specialize on spotted wing. And that was the two uh, parasitoids, Gnaspis and Leptopolina, and especially Gnaspis. Next. So what we see here is the composition of these two parasitoids in China, Chinese collections. Uh, red is Gnaspis, blue is Leptopolina. What's good to see is that they work well together. Leptopolina will kind of outcompete Gnaspis, but Gnaspis and Leptopolina can coexist in the same habitat. That's good because they can have a synergistic effect. Next. And what we see here is average percent parasitism on four different host plants. Two rubus, um, Sambucus, which is the little wild mountain strawberry, and Fragraria, which is, I'm sorry, Fragraria is a little wild mountain strawberry, and Sambucus is more like a large bush. This is about what I would expect from Gnaspis in the United States. Some place between 20 and 60% parasitism if it can get established. So if we can reduce the background level of spotted wing Drosophila by that amount early in the season, and these were collections made, we were even getting snowfall in some of these collections. So uh, this is really early in the season, and if you extend that out later in the season, we can have a pretty good impact on what's coming into your crop system. Next, please. So when are you gonna get this material? Uh, it's a long and tedious process getting these parasitoids out of quarantine. Uh, we first have to show that spotted wing is a pest, obviously it is, and we have to show that there's no good natural enemies that are giving us control in the United States, which we've also done. Next, please. Then we have to uh, obtain funding. We have to obtain uh, colleagues at the areas where we're going to import natural enemies from. We have to know where the natural enemies can best be found. We have to obtain USDA permits and just initiate the importation program. Next. We've done all that. We've conducted now five foreign explorations. We've got the natural enemies in quarantine. We've completed the efficiency tests, the host specificity tests, the biology tests. And where are we right now? Next. Um, we have shown that Gnaspis brasiliensis is a specialist. We prepared a permit. We submitted that permit six months ago, and that was the second submission. And we're waiting now for approval from USDA APHIS. And then hopefully in 2020, we'll get that approval. We'll start mass production of the natural enemies. We'll get mass production going, not just in my laboratory, but in regional insectaries throughout North America. And we'll start to release the natural enemy and look at its effectiveness. Next. And so in summary, we've got a petition which has been reviewed. I contacted USDA APHIS and the reviewers comments are being tabulated at this point in time. It is for this one parasitoid, Gnaspis brasiliensis. All four pictures are of this insect. Next. We're looking at only a specific strain of this Gnaspis, the G1 strain. Next. It's found in South Korea, Japan, China. And I want to point out, it has been found in Canada as well. So um, this bodes well for us being able to get this permission to release it throughout the United States. Next. And the one thing I want to do still is to improve our mass production methods. And we are going to look at differences between the G1 strain and the G strain, G3 strain. But that's kind of delving a little bit into the weeds. So with that, I appreciate your attention and I'll turn it over, I believe, back to Ash. Thank you.
And All right, thank you. Um, hi, my name's uh, Craig Robus. I'm a postdoc at the University of Georgia. I'm gonna talk about chemical control. Uh, and chemical control uh, is a major component of SWD management. Uh, because there's a zero tolerance for SWD infestation in fruit uh, and all the other pest management tactics we've uh, discussed so far in this webinar are still being developed or optimized. And with chemical control, we have need that immediate effect um, to uh, protect fruit. And one of the main challenges is that there are fewer effective products approved for use in organic berry production compared to conventional production. And uh, we found in, in our previous work is, is spinosad, uh, which is labeled as in trust for organic agriculture, really is the most effective product available at this time. Um, however, label restrictions uh, limit the amount that can be applied uh, in a given year, and also the frequency of applications that can be done in a given year. Uh, furthermore, resistance to spinosad is a major concern. Um, so spinosad resistance has been documented in California, and this is in the area where it was first reported in North America. Uh, so this is not surprising because this is the area we've had the longest history of uh, spinosad use against spotting Drosophila, and so there's been a lot of pressure to develop resistance. And we can see uh, in this table here these higher Resistance ratios indicate it takes a higher concentration of spinosad to kill uh, the to kill the flies, and uh, you can see that uh, you know, when inducing this, uh, it can be nine times higher, um, or even from other populations, uh, up to 20 times higher than. Uh, what we consider, um, I guess, our, our baseline. So it's definitely a, uh, it could be a major concern if we have one product and there's a risk that we could have control failure. So part of our research goal has been to evaluate organically approved insecticides uh, that can be used in combination with Entrust or as an alternative. Uh, the results shown here from a laboratory experiment, and these are typical of what we've observed in our, um, in our research, where Entrust was very effective at killing the spotted and Drosophila adults and uh, consequently reducing the infestation we find in fruit, while the other products were slightly to moderately effective or not effective at all. And this too, we, we tested this with uh, adjuvants to see if they could improve performance of the less effective products. But generally, we did not find an effect. The results from our laboratory experiments were also confirmed in field experiments. In this case, we uh, had applied the insecticides to blueberry bushes and then collected leaves and fruit, put them in test arenas uh, to, uh, and exposed them to uh, spotting Drosophila adults. Um, and this one, I want to show that you know, we add the, with the adjuvant, it didn't really extend that residue age. It still broke down, uh, we see, three to five days after application. So the issue is having to repeat applications frequently, which, again, is a, is a limitation with products like Entrust. In some cases, you can see here, we also had some products that uh, were more effective or comparable to Entrust, but they tend to vary uh, between our experiments and research sites. So sometimes we don't have very consistent uh, results. So the current uh, project we have, um, one of the items we're looking at are these crop sterilants. We receive reports that some producers are using sterilants as part of spotting Drosophila management programs uh, using these basically in rotation with insecticides. These are products that are strong oxidizers and really designed to uh, control plant pathogens. Uh, now, why this applies to spotting Drosophila is that uh, the vinegar flies like spotting Drosophila have an association with naturally occurring yeasts that may play a role in their behavior in ecology, such as finding hosts or 
uh, egg laying cues. Um, and so this past year, we, we focused on investigating these products. The idea that if we can incorporate the, they can disrupt uh, spotting Drosophila biology, but also could be incorporated in a rotation and extend the interval between and trust applications. So we started with some small plot trials conducted to test weekly applications of these sterilants. And shown here are results from our Florida and Georgia uh, trials. And in the Florida trial, two out of the four weeks that were sampled, there was reduction with the jet ag, uh, one of the sterilant products compared to the control, but in the other weeks, it was not different from the control. So it wasn't completely consistent. Uh, in Georgia, we had very low numbers, and uh, you may see a numerically slight reduction in number of larvae per berry uh, or per uh, um, kilogram of berries, but those numbers are very low, and it was very highly variable. Uh, I don't have the information to show here, but a similar trial was conducted in Michigan that did show that using a sterilant uh, the jet ag product was effective at reducing spotted wing uh, infestation in blueberries. Uh, there was another experiment conducted in Oregon that had promising results. In this case, uh, the berries uh, were covered with a bag and the, the um, spiring drosophila were introduced into the bag, so it kind of forced uh, egg laying on the, on the fruit. Uh, in this case, uh, there was a reduction in the number of eggs on the berries with residues up to three days old. Uh, so that may indicate that uh, the frequency of applications is, is perhaps twice a week, um, that it might be able to keep it, uh, keep the numbers down. But there was, uh, again, there was, there was indication that this uh, did have a, a positive effect. Uh, and I'm going to continue with some work. Uh, it's mainly done our collaborators in Maryland. Uh, and this is switching. Those previous experiments were in blueberries. This is on um, blackberries. And in Maryland, they looked closer at the yeast uh, and, and fruit fungal community. So in this experiment, uh, the treated uh, blackberries um, sampled the the berries immediately before application and after application of a jet egg and uh, did not see differences. Um, this was also repeated a uh, second time and did not see a difference between the control and jet egg um, with this single application. Uh, this shows the number of yeasts that they found on the berries. Uh, and here there were also no significant differences between the control and jet egg before at, before and after application. Uh, but the, there was a reduction in the number of yeast uh, after application, sort of within the control and within the jet egg. Um, there's a lot that we need to more to learn about this because uh, there, there wasn't the, the trend was opposite in the in the second run of this um, of this trial. So it wasn't entirely clear what was going on there, but this, um, this is a very interesting piece of, uh, piece of the story because here we see that the yeast uh, composition differed before and after. So some are only present before application and some are only present after application. So this could be a key part of how they affect spotwing drosophila but there's a lot more we need to learn about the flies and the yeast and how these sanitizers uh, work in combination with these, these yeasts. So there's a slight comp change in yeast composition. Uh, in this experiment shown here, uh, this was in laboratory and auger plates were inoculated with yeast strains uh, that were isolated from Spotting Drosophila larval frass. So it's known that it's associated with our pest. Uh, jet ag was administered in the center of the plate. Uh, and you can see that clear area around that center point shows that 
the jet eggs strongly inhibited yeast growth. Uh, the question is, well, how does this work with the fruit itself? Uh, and the, the question that was raised was whether coverage would uh, could be an issue when treating uh, blackberries or, or raspberries as well, because these fruits have a complex structure and uh, incomplete coverage with the sterilant could possibly leave pockets of yeast that could recolonize the fruit rapidly. So uh, the reapplication uh, would be necessary. So to summarize uh, chemical control, although much progress uh, is being made in developing our non-chemical SWD management tactics, we still have a need to find organically approved insecticides for use in berry production and those alternatives to, uh, to spinosad. Insecticide rotation uh, is necessary to comply with our label requirements for spinosad and to mitigate resistance. And there are some new formulations and products uh, with planning to evaluate this year. Um, some producers are using sterilants as part of their insecticide control programs for spotting Drosophila. Uh, in our small plot trials, we saw some differences in efficacy among our sites and it seemed to be more efficacious in northern sites like Oregon and Michigan and not, uh, not so efficacious in the southeast in our Florida and Georgia sites. So we know that sometimes our performance uh, and how we're managing things differs by region. So there might be a regional effect. Uh, we need to look at that closer. Found that the sterilants didn't change total yeast abundance, but did change the yeast comp uh, the composition slightly. And really, uh, this is kind of an area that's wide open. There's a lot of work um, we have yet to do on how these products work and determining the mechanisms uh, and their interaction with uh, the yeast and Spotter and Drosophila. Uh, so with that, I will turn it over to Ash to summarize. Thank you. Can't hear you yet. All right. Okay. As I mentioned earlier, overall goal of this project is to develop a, a multi-pronged systems-based approach that involves behavioral, cultural, and biological control strategies that can be used to control SWD in organic systems, keeping chemical control as a last resort when necessary. And what we have learned so far uh, related to behavioral strategies is that SPLAT, which is also known as hook SWD, did reduce SWD fruit infestations at lower SWD population densities which does make it a, a useful early season tool and in, in situations where overall populations are lower. Another product that is in the process of development by some members of this team, uh, food grade gum, uh, also reduced SWD fruit infestations for up to 21 days. However, efficacy of this product uh, decreased as uh, we moved further away from the point source. Studies are currently underway to determine the difference between different point sources of the gum in the field. Uh, related to cultural control strategies, we investigated several different uh, strategies uh, that may be useful in controlling SWD. For example, a physical exclusion, if installed appropriately in a timely manner, it can provide 100% control of SWD when using appropriate materials of less than one millimeter mesh size netting and also uh, implemented before SWD uh, populations uh, arrive at the, uh, in, in the field or fruit becomes susceptible. Uh, weed mats, which can be used as mulches, they also uh, reduced SWD survivorship and fruit infestations. Pruning of the, of the plants, heavy pruning, did help in by modifying the canopy climate. For example, the heavy pruning increased uh, temperature, decreased humidity in the canopy, which led to lower SWD fruit infestations in some situations. Uh, frequent harvests and properly removing and destroying of the cull fruit from the field did reduce risk of fruit infestation in some situations uh, as well. And lastly, if infested fruit is suspected, 
when you harvest post harvest refrigeration uh, at 30 to 36 degree Fahrenheit for three to five days can kill larvae inside the fruit and uh, avoid the risk of fruit rejection when selling the fruit or packing the fruit. Among biological control, as uh, Kent described, members of this team are currently working on biological control uh, methods. Native parasitoids are not effective in reducing SWD infestations. Exotic parasitoids did show uh, promise in initial studies and the uh, application to uh, get permit for field releases and evaluation has been uh, submitted and reviewed. As soon as we get permissions, we will uh, initiate field releases and studies and also at the same time, keep improving protocols to mass produce these beneficial uh, uh, agents to control SWD in the field. As far as chemical control, and trust still remains the most effective option for organic SWD control and other materials, for example, uh, Grandivo, Piganic, and Azera, uh, can and should be used in rotations to make sure we don't overuse and trust and increase the risk of resistance development. Resistance has already, to and trust has already been documented in California and uh, monitoring in other regions is underway and should continue to make sure we detect resistance before it becomes widespread issue and also implement rotational program to manage resistance. We did evaluate uh, crop sterilants such as jet ag and uh, uh, oxidate uh, and they were effective in reducing SWD fruit infestations in some region, especially in uh, up north in, in Michigan and Oregon. However, in southeastern US in Florida and Georgia, we did not see that uh, effect of those uh, crop sterilants. Uh, while uh, the exact mode of action of these crop sterilants is unclear, initial studies did show no difference in total yield, uh, yeast abundance, but slight changes in the yeast community of different species of yeasts was observed. So it means that it does target or controls or kills some species of yeast that may have some impact on SWD overall abundance. So this is what we know so far. And uh, with that, I thank you all very much for taking, taking time to join the webinar and listening to us. Now I will open the forum for questions. Before we go to the question, let me show you some of the online resources that we have developed. These resources are hosted by different institutions who are part of the are uh, part of this uh, or, uh, SWD organic management project team. And also would like to acknowledge and USD and NIFA who provided us funding for this project through Organic Agriculture Research Initiative Program. And some other uh, funding was also provided uh, by, by some of the other organizations to do this work in part. So oh, um, we have a number of questions. So I'm just going to scroll through here. Um, okay. Um, okay. Is the effect of three to five days of refrigeration on the saleable quality of the fruit also being studied? So anybody can just unmute and chime in. I think it a lot of people are muted. So just feel free to unmute yourself there. So you... my understanding that it is that it is being studied, um, but also that it's the way to, that there's been some work looking at how to implement this during kind of traditional transport and distribution of the fruit so that it, it's part of the supply chain and part of the cold chain of moving the fruit. Um, okay. Um, let's see, um, I've got to, just got to f go through here from the beginning because um, there's a whole bunch of stuff going on in the chat box here. Oh yeah, um, somebody was interested in just finding out a little bit more what splat or hook actually is. Can somebody just go into a little bit more detail about what that is? Because I know Ash typed in, it stands for Specialized Pheromone and Lure Application Technology, but some people might not be familiar with what that product is. 
Um, yeah, I can answer that. So the splat itself is actually their term for the gel matrix that they use for many different products. If you went to the website, they have products for a number of different insects, and it's usually mixed with some kind of an attractant, which with a lot of insects is a pheromone. We don't have one for SWD, so for SWD, it's a food-based war. And then some kind of a chemical product that kills the pest. So in the case of SWD, they have one with spinosad in it. We're wanting to look into mixing the product with other other chemicals because they do have a version of hook available that is just the attractant in the gel and does not have a specific chemical product so that growers would be able to mix other chemicals in. Um, so we're looking into one of our next steps is looking into that. So that's what it is. If any of you are familiar with uh, Nickelodeon slime, it has about that consistency. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. That's great. Thank you. Um, do you know if there are any other in unintended consequences that um, the parasites, presumably those from Asia, might have on other insects? No, they're really not. I answered uh, part of this in the chat as oh, well. Okay. One yep, of the I see that. Yeah, one of the things that we have to do to get these things out of quarantine is to to test them against so many different insects. We tested these against 24 different fruit fly species. And the Gnaspis brasiliensis really only attacked uh, Spotowin drosophila, uh, Drosophila melanogaster, and Drosophila simulans. Those three species are really closely related. It prefers the strain we're trying to get out, really prefers Suzukii. And Suzukii is a little bit larger than Melanogaster, so it likes to have, go after the larger larva. Um, and in terms of what would happen in the field, these parasitoids, just like Suzukii, has evolved to really go after the ripening fruit, not the rotten fruit. So you, you find your peach on the ground, and it's got all kinds of Melanogaster and simulans and other fly species in it, but melanogaster attacks it once that fruit is rotted. Well, melanogaster will in turn be attacked by a lot of other parasitoid species. And these are, are cued in to going after that rotten fruit to find fruit fly species in it, whereas the Gnaspis really cues in on something else. So we, we don't think there's going to be any uh, major non-target impacts. Okay, thank you. Um, I had a couple of questions about different oils. Um, one person asked about using an all-season horticultural oil, and then someone else asked about whether there are any essential oils um, that might deter spotted ring drosophila. Uh, well, I can answer the essential oil question. Um, there, I'm aware of a number of uh, experiments that are conducted, um, really a whole variety of essential oils, um, but most of them appear to be laboratory studies. We haven't done any of this with our group yet, um, but we do have plans to add this uh, this coming year. Uh, and it looked like there was some promise with like peppermint oil and thyme oil. Um, I don't know at what concentrations off the top of my head, um, but some work has been done, but uh, I'm not aware of anything that was tried on like a um, field uh, field scale for uh, looking at spotting Drosophila, at least. Okay. Um, we had a couple of questions about the mention of um, predators of spotted wing Drosophila in Canada. Um, do you know where in Canada it was found? In the Okanagan Valley, Fraser Valley, Vancouver Island? It was found, so um, this is, I, I saw that question as well. This was asking about Gnaspis. So Leptopelina, Japonica, and Gnaspis brasiliensis were both 
found just this last year in Western Canada uh, to the east of Van the Vancouver metropolis area. It's kind of a, a banana belt uh, of Canada where they're growing all kinds of fruit crops uh, a little bit to the south uh, west of the Okanagan Valley where they've got the wine grapes. Um, they're not, question also asked, they're not native to Canada, they're native to Asia. They're probably both from China, um, probably both evolved with Spotum gasophila. Um, they were not found in Canada just three years ago when they were doing surveys. They were only recently found in Canada by a, a, a new researcher working for Agri-Canada, I think the USDA of Canada. So it's exciting. Um, that means they can survive in some of the colder areas. Um, it doesn't change what we're doing with our permit. Uh, it's Canada is not the US, so that still means we cannot release these in the United States until we get the, the permit uh, from the USDA APHIS. Um, it does mean that there's a, a pathway for them to get into the United States uh, going south from Canada. And the reason I, I'm hypothesizing that they were recently found there is because we've gone through some recent uh, trade negotiations in the United States with both China and Canada uh, and other countries as uh, um, the administration was changing trade policies. And it wouldn't surprise me if, if because of that, uh, Canada was slightly increasing their importation of soft fruits uh, from Asia into Canada, into that region. And perhaps they came along with that imported fruit. Um, probably the same accidental introduction pathway that we got spotted wing from. Hmm. Okay, thank you. Um, has there been any research done to see if poultry rotated through berry crops post-harvest could decrease pupae populations and overwintering survival of spotted wing? Uh, this is Ash. I, I can uh, take a stab at this question. Uh, our group has not done work on this uh, particular way to control SWD. However, uh, SWD do not overwinter as pupae in the field. So it is less likely to affect overall uh, SWD uh, populations in the field if you use poultry after harvest in, the, in any of the berry fields. Okay, thanks. Um, we have a couple questions of the effects of various um, materials on beneficials. For example, um, do materials such as oxidate and jet ag have a negative impact on parasitoid population? Maybe some of the insecticide folks got a better answer for this. Um, in terms of the parasitoid populations, I think their biggest impact is going to be outside of your commercial crop system. It's going to be in the riparian zones. It's going to be in those regions where spotted wing is coming from. And in those regions, they typically do not get insecticides. Um, I think that in the hoop houses, if you can control the insecticide materials um, that you're putting on and you're using something like um, uh, organically certified materials, then it's a, a product by product test. So for example, spinosids have been shown in the past to be pretty harsh on some beneficial insects, especially parasitoids, I believe, from some earlier studies. So it, it would be a, a pesticide by pesticide um, based answer and, and one that I cannot fully answer at this point in time. Okay, um, Kent, you also mentioned the use of nematodes on spotted wing drosophila populations. Are any of these available on the market currently? And if so, how effective are they? So that was, um, that came out of Jaina's really nice uh, manuscript. And what I would do is I would uh, have you go to that manuscript. It is an open access manuscript. Um, and you can slideshow talk. So you can just Google the title and download the manuscript. 
And in the appendix, you can see a number of different studies working with nematodes to see how effective they were. Um, I've played with nematodes in the past, and I found them to be highly variable because the environment you're releasing them into becomes quite critical. They need to have a moist environment. So if you're working in you know, blueberries in California in the San Joaquin Valley, they typically just don't work very well. But if you're working in a, a system with uh, higher moisture, especially in the ground, uh, they, they might have an impact. Um, I've not done any of that work for spotted wings, so I, I really suggest going to that manuscript. And what I saw in, in the appendix is that some studies said there was a little bit of an impact, some studies said uh, less of an impact, some studies said more of an impact. So uh, that's what I'd refer you to. Okay, um, let's see. Um, is there a danger of pick your own customers being exposed to spinosad through the splat? Good timing. I was just typing an answer to that question, <laughs> okay. but this will be faster. Yeah, and everybody will hear it, so that's great. Um, no, there's not. Uh, you apply it to the foliage and or the leaves and the, the stem near the base of the plant. It's not applied to the fruit. And it does have a restricted entry interval, meaning no one's supposed to come in after it's sprayed of, it's at least 12 hours, I think, essentially so it can dry. And even if someone touched the dried product, there would be a lot less spinosad in there than if they touched, if, if they went into a field to you pick the day after you'd sprayed and trust. So <laughs> no, there's not a, a high risk of that as long as you make, you know, follow the rules so that it's dry before they're going in there and picking. Okay, we had a comment about essential oils, and that is that someone typed in that his understanding is that essential oils applied in June, July, and August can burn the leaves. So I don't know if anyone has a comment about that. Uh, yes, essential oils are uh, commonly known to have some phytotoxicity. Again, it depends on the temperature uh, uh, that you apply at, and also in the density of the oil. And also they can leave actually visible marks on the fruit surface as well if the conditions are not right. So that's why we do not uh, recommend too much focus on, on oils when you have a lot of foliage and uh, uh, in particular fruits out there. Okay. And also actually I wanted to make comment regarding a question that was negative effects of jet egg or oxidate on uh, parastoids. And Jana Lee did some work and she actually uh, uh, put a note here in the chat box saying that uh, jet egg was not toxic to SWD, so we are not expecting it to be directly toxic to other insects. Good question to address this summer. But as you, you know, these uh, uh, jet egg or oxidate, these are surface sterilants. They are not insecticides. They are actually used as fungicides in the field. The, all they do is they kill microorganisms, especially fungi and yeasts. And by virtue of killing yeast, they have some impact on SWD, which is not directly related to the beneficial organisms or parasitoids. So they are less likely to harm uh, parasitoids out in the field. Okay, we had a question of, um, out of all the products available, is there a clear number two product for effectiveness to use um, after in trust? I did, uh, this is Ash again, I, I did uh, put uh, a response to this question in the uh, chat box there. Uh, it, there's no other organic product that is as effective as Entrust, uh, but they are all, uh, they're all sort of soft materials, relatively less effective, but they have, can be used in rotation programs with Entrust. So there's no clear winner but there are a couple good candidates that, that uh, uh, can be used. For example, uh, Grandivo or uh, Azera, uh, th those are a, a good candidate to be used in rotations with the uh, Entrust. We also published a, a extension bulletin. I put uh, is a link is available on, in the slide deck in the, uh, at the slide where I mentioned online resources. Please review that uh, extension bulletin. 
uh, that has a lot of information about uh, alternatives to uh, and trust for organic management of SWD as well. Okay, yeah, you can find the link um, to that in the chat box and um, you can also find it on the project website um, as a link under the resources page and I just, I'm putting that up here in case anybody wants to copy the address of the project website down um, and the project website will have this recording as well on it and additional updates um, from the project as it continues. Um, so we have still a number of questions, so we'll try to get to um, several more here. Um, has any work been done to measure the biocontrol contribution of spiders against spotted wing Drosophila adults, particularly jumping spiders or orb weavers? I have not looked at that. Um, spiders, we did a lot of work with spiders in vineyards, and they're often overlooked natural enemy. Uh, one of the problems with spiders is that they classically cannot be manipulated in terms of their numbers. So um, there's different terminologies for this, but basically the idea is that the parasitoid populations will increase in numbers if you have more spotted wing drosophila, driving the pest population down. Whereas spiders oftentimes have only one or two generations per year. Uh, and they're oftentimes, the web built builders are uh, not going to forage away from their web. The wandering hunters will forage a little area, but they won't forage very far from their, their zone. So if you've got a lot of spiders, they can have a big impact, but the spiders are probably there to feed on something else as well. And if you've got a lot of spotted wing that show up in, say, a blueberry field, it's hard to get the spiders to react quickly in terms of increasing in numbers to have an impact on the spotted wing. Uh, Ken, we did a study here in, in Georgia. We sampled, in general, beneficial uh, 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 organisms out in the beneficial arthropods out in, the, in blueberry fields at several farms and what we saw that overall, uh, and we actually used their gut content analysis approach to see if they, any of those uh, uh, species uh, consumed SWD. What we found that, that it was the rate of uh, SWD consumption in those uh, species, including several spider species was extremely low. It was less than 1% at best. Okay. I'm oh, sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> that doesn't surprise me because the spiders would have, they'd have to be web builders catching the fruit fly when it comes in, and uh, they've got no access to the larva. Okay. Um, we are unfortunately out of time because I'm sure we could easily spend another hour talking about this and answering more questions because um, there are so many. But um, meanwhile, I'd like to thank everyone for all these great questions. And um, I'd like to thank all of the presenters for joining us today, as well as their collaborators who aren't presenting, and the NIFA OREI for um, sponsoring this research. And thanks to everyone for joining us. Thanks so much.